So welcome to Montana Tech's uh, second to last public lecture of the semester. Delighted you all came. Thank you for being here. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jane Mangold. Uh, Jane is um, an associate professor at the um, Ag School in Natural in, in Land Resources and Environmental Sciences at Montana State University over in Bozeman. And uh, she got her bachelor's degree in biology in Iowa and her master's and her PhD both at MSU. She's also done some work in southeastern Oregon and uh, she knows a lot about invasive plants and it's something that we will dive here and do a lot. And so please join me in welcoming Jane to tell us about invasive plants on Montana's range and wildlands. Thanks, Bev. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see such a turnout at 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Um, and I did see some invasive plants around Butte earlier today. Robert, Robert had me out looking at some places, and I saw a few weedy species. So, um, uh, And it's, it's good to be here with Bev. I first met Bev on a float, well, an indigenous knowledge field trip August 2016. So we kind of made a connection there. And, Thanks a lot, Bev, for inviting me to come over. Okay, so we're going to talk about invasive plants on Montana's range and wildlands. And what I, this, this is a photo right here. This is up along the Flathead River, um, uh, kind of in the Mission Valley area. That's all spotted knapweed in the foreground. It's not flowering, so it's not quite as impressive as if it were flowering, but um, that's why that picture's up there. Most of you probably are familiar with spotted knapweed. It's like the poster child weed of Montana. So what I'd like to talk about today is I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am um, in addition to what Bev told you introducing me. And then I thought I'd just spend a few minutes kind of giving um, my perspective of the overview of invasive plants in Montana. Um, and then I'll, I thought I'd talk about three research projects that I've been part of over the last five years or so um, that I thought would kind of be a wide variety of weeds and a wide variety of topics, give you a little bit of a sampler of the type of research that I do. So a little bit about myself. Well, I'll start by saying that it's really not about me. It's about all the people that are part of my lab because they're the ones that are getting all the work done when, I'm, when I get to the, you know, the pleasure of being out talking about weeds. So um, Noelle is, uh, she is our diagnostician at the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. Has anyone ever submitted a plant for identification to the lab or maybe you've taken it to your extension office or weed district office to get identified? Anybody use that? A couple people. Yeah, so Noelle is the person that's identifying those plants that come into our lab. So Montana State has a diagnostic lab. If you have unknown plants, insects or plant diseases that you want to know what's going on with your plant, you can send them to the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. And it's a free charge for anyone um, who lives in Montana. Stacy Davis is a research associate of mine um, that helps me do all this research. Audrey Harvey is a, uh, my only current graduate student. Um, Chantelle Frame Martin is the, statewide, or the coordinator for the statewide education campaign on noxious weeds. You've, anybody seen any billboards? Pretty wildflowers, think again. Those are Chantel's creation over the last couple years. And then my lab employs uh, undergrads during the summer that help us with work. These are just three of the undergrads that have been working with us the last couple, couple years. So it's not just about me, but all this work gets done with a lot of people. So I have an extension appointment at Montana State and um, an extension and research appointment. So my job is to go around the state and, and work with our stakeholders and, and provide science-based information for them so they can better manage their invasive plants. And this map of Montana, that wherever you see a star, that's a county where I've given at least one presentation. <coughs> so the only county I'm missing right now is Petroleum County, and I'm not sure anyone even lives there. So <laughs> um, that, that's kind of a joke. But anyway, 
I show you this because uh, I want to share with you that I, I'm out across the state a lot and I get to interact with people who are managing invasive plants. Ranchers, I work a lot with the state and federal agency people, the county weed districts, county extension. Um, and uh, I, I share information with them, but what I think is even more important is I learn so much from them. And, and understanding what they're dealing with with some of these invasive plants that they're trying to manage. We do, I do have a website that has both extension and research information on it. There's a lot of publications on there. There's information about the different studies we're doing. There's links to other sources of information at, in Montana, so check that out. That's all I'm going to say about myself because that's what we really want to talk about is invasive plants. Um, so an overview of the situation in Montana, and please uh, understand that this is my perspective, okay, given the amount of time I spend out around the state. So I like to talk about obnoxious to noxious to invasive plants. And what I've found when I visit with people across Montana is some people don't really understand what the difference is. They hear a lot of terms being thrown around about invasive plants or weeds and, and they don't necessarily understand like what's the difference between noxious, what, what is a noxious weed. So an obnoxious weed is maybe something like dandelion. It's troublesome, you know, maybe you don't like it, it's kind of a nuisance, but it hasn't really been documented to cause ecological or economic harm, okay? Now a noxious weed is troublesome. Um, but it has been documented or it's believed to cause ecological and ecological harm. And because those, those, harm, the, those impacts are large enough or serious enough, the state actually designates certain species as noxious. Um, and as a landowner, you have a le legal obligation to control those species on your land. So that's what a noxious weed is. And Montana has 35 species on its noxious weed list right now. And then counties can also add their own species that aren't on the state list. Now another term you might hear is invasive weed or an invasive plant. And they, they like noxious weeds, invasive plants, they're troublesome. They can cause ecological and economic harm. Or they have impacts but they may or may not be designated noxious. So can anyone in the room think of a potentially invasive, or an invasive plant in Montana that isn't necessarily noxious in terms of you have to control it on your land? Cheatgrass? Yeah, that's the picture I have right here. <laughs> Cheatgrass is the probably, I mean, that would be the, the plant that comes to mind first for me in terms of invasive but not noxious. So with the type of work that I do, you know, I'm focused mostly on the noxious weeds, but also over the years I've done work on invasive plants, particularly cheatgrass, um, that is not noxious, but it is, is cause, causing a lot of impacts and people are very concerned about it. So trying to understand how to best manage those invasive plants. Just some examples of some of the four of the more common noxious weeds in Montana. Um, sulfur sink foil, spotted knapweed, leafy spurge, Canada thistle. Like I said, there's 31 other ones that are just as common or maybe not as common as these. But then, uh, like you said, with cheatgrass, here's a picture of cheatgrass, that reddish purple color on this side of this ravine certainly invasive but not noxious and what's what's growing up the center of that draw yeah leafy spurge so we got still have some native grasses hanging around over here so so just kind of give you that that context of um, we do have invasive species that are not necessarily on a noxious weed list okay so what's what's so bad about these species why do we care about them um, why do they get put on the noxious weed list? They have a variety of impacts. Um, uh, the Department of Agriculture is the, the state agency that um, administers the, 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 noxious, or the noxious weed list. And that's primarily because 
uh, they are known to reduce forage and crop yields, so that it's a detriment to agricultural industry in the state. Um, but these plants can also reduce native plant diversity, which can then decrease wildlife habitat. Um, with certain species like cheatgrass, there is a risk, uh, an increased fire risk. Um, you, you might see increased soil erosion that uh, has been documented with certain invasive plants. Maybe changes in soil nutrient cycling, and some plants are even uh, potentially harmful to wildlife, livestock, and humans because they're, of their toxicity. So a variety of impacts um, that cause us to be concerned about these species. Thinking, uh, you know, thinking about the state as a whole, and again, this is my perspective, uh, the distributions of invasive plants in Montana, and here uh, is, we're thinking about invasive forbs. So those are most of, forbs are broad-leaved plants. Those are most of the species that we have listed as noxious weeds in Montana. And in general, we have more of these invasive forbs kind of in the western third of the state, and you see fewer of these as you move east across the state. Okay, now why do you think that is? Moisture. I hear moisture, okay, potentially. Wind. wind, it could be wind. Some of those seeds are wind dispersed. People, people. I hear people. What about people? There's more people in the Yeah, there's more people over here than over here. You look like you want to say something. Oh, it's more diverse habitat. So you're saying that it's easier for weeds to invade there? Like diversity begets diversity? <laughs> more places that certain things could grow. Okay, yeah. Okay. Any other ideas? It's not as flat. It's not as flat. Why would that influence? What do you think? Because it has more different slopes, more different... Okay. So that's getting back to his comment about there's a wider variety of habitats maybe where these species could invade, get a foothold. Okay, okay, all right. Well, here's a few ideas that I have, and some of these are corroborated <laughs> in the literature. In general, uh, invasive species tend to move from coastal areas inland because a lot of things get imported at the coast usually unintentionally. So if you think about, if you look at the history of a lot of the, the species on our noxious weed list, they first showed up in Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, and then made their way inland. Okay, so that's one idea. Human habitation is another idea, like weeds like to be where humans are. We drag them around with us, so they're getting dispersed, but humans also create disturbance, and weeds love disturbance. So the two go kind of hand in hand. Um, so yeah, probably you know there's more people living here, more disturbance, less people, less disturbance in the eastern part of the state. Climate, um, if you think about the climate kind of on the west side of the divide, uh, it's, it's more Mediterranean-like. You have hot, dry summers and warm, or cool, moist, winters and springs. And a lot of our weedy forbs, our noxious weeds, came from places where the environment is a little more Mediterranean-like. So they might be doing better the, the western third of the state because the climate is more similar to where they came from. And then um, I suspect that maybe the, the, the composition of the plant communities in the western part of the state compared to the eastern part of the state is, is maybe playing a role. Um, as you move, if you, if you get into probably about the, la, the most eastern third of Montana, there's more warm season species. Um, I think you see a few more rhizomatous grasses. And, and I wonder if that isn't playing a role in why some of these cooler season weedy forbs especially, um, you know, just don't do as well over here. Even if the seeds get there, the habitat might not be right for them to invade, okay? So those are some ideas that I have. Some of the same ideas were echoed from those of you in the audience, okay? So invasive forbs, noxious weeds. 
Now, we've talked a little bit about cheatgrass. Um, in addition to those invasive forbs, the noxious weeds that we have on our list, there's a suite of invasive annual grasses that are becoming more and more common in Montana. And you're probably familiar with downy brome or cheatgrass, uh, maybe Japanese brome. You've heard of Japanese brome? It's close, it's, this is Bromus japonicus, Bromus tectorum, so they're close cousins. But we also have uh, Medusa head that showed up in Montana about mm, three, let's see, it was November of 2014 is when we first found it, so that's three years ago. Is that all it is? Three years? And then uh, Ventanata, which is right here, that's a, another invasive annual grass that uh, really seems to be on the increase in, um, in Montana, the western half of Montana. So if we think about where are these invasive annual grasses, well, cheatgrass and Japanese brome, they're pretty ubiquitous, um, but there's more Japanese brome in the eastern, far eastern part of the state, more cheatgrass in the, probably the western two-thirds of Montana. And then the areas where I've seen a lot of Ventanata are kind of the Bitterroot Valley area up into the Mission Valley. Um, there's quite a bit of it in Gallatin County, and I suspect that there's probably more Ventanata out there in between <laughs> these gold blobs than, than what we know. It's, it's a species that people are just starting to even learn what it is. So um, we're just kind of starting to pick up on its distribution across the state. And then the only place that we know of Medusa head being is um, near, the Ar near Arli, north of Missoula, on some tribal lands. Um, so there's a real uh, concerted effort to do ED early detection rapid response for that species and try to keep it from spreading, okay? So that's kind of a, a perspective on the invasive annual grasses in Montana, all right? Uh, recently, some colleagues and I uh, did, we surveyed livestock producers that were producing their livestock on private grazing lands in Montana. And one of the questions we asked them was, uh, we gave them a list of the noxious weeds and we said, which we, you know, list the three most common weeds on your private grazing land. And this is how they responded. About 65% of the respondents listed Canada thistle about 45 listed leafy spurge, and then hound's tongue was about four, almost 40 percent, which you don't hear as much about hound's tongue as you do maybe spotted knapweed. So we asked them just about noxious weed presence, but then another question we asked them was, of those noxious weeds that are on your property, which ones do you think are causing the largest impact to your livestock production? And this is how they responded to that question. In this case, uh, the top three were leafy spurge, Canada thistle, and knapweed, which included spotted knapweed and diffuse knapweed. We didn't separate those two out. So that's kind of interesting to just kind of get that perspective from what uh, livestock producers are saying as far as um, what's going on in private grazing lands. This did not include any uh, public leased grazing land. Uh, so I mentioned that the Montana Department of Agriculture kind of runs the noxious weed program in the state. Um, they, there is a, a noxious weed management plan. They updated it this year, um, earlier in the year. Uh, they estimate that there's about 9 million acres of Montana that are infested with noxious weeds. Now that sounds like a lot of land, right? It's kind of like, whoa, that's really depressing. But what I like to point out to people is that's only 9% of our state. And a lot of Montana is weed free. And although we tend to kind of notice the weeds, especially me, I mean, <laughs> I'm probably the worst for you know driving down the highway and noticing the weeds or looking out across the landscape and noticing the weeds. Most of our state is weed free, and I think that's a real important message to convey is that um, you know, we should be really focused on preventing those areas that don't have weeds from getting weeds and, and keeping those areas as pristine as possible. And a large part of my education and outreach program is focused on early detection and rapid response. 
and um, you know, preventing weeds from moving any further than they currently are. So if you're really interested in noxious weeds, you know, take a look at this, um, the management plan. It gives a good perspective on what's going on in the state. There's the different chapters that they talk about. Um, and it's, it's kind of, uh, it's fun to, there's, there's estimates of acreages for all the species that are on our state noxious weed list. So if you're particularly interested, check that out. Okay? Any questions up to this point? Yes? What constitutes investing? What, oh, good question. Is it one plant or is it 20% cover? You know, that's, uh, that's not a question that we have a good answer for. And that was actually when, when the Department of Ag was uh, kind of rewriting the weed management plan, that was a question that some of us at MSU were asking, like, how did you, because the estimates come in from the county weed districts. And one of the questions we asked was, well, how are the counties defining an area as being infested? So we don't have a good answer to that. Um, I have looked in the literature, and I don't really find good answers to that. Um, but yeah, so good question, no answer. <laughs> Bev. It refers to noxious weeds, so dandelions don't count. No, it, yeah, but you're I, correct. I mean, yeah, so she was asking, uh, those acreages are referring to noxious weeds, and yes, it's only those 35 species that are designated as noxious in the state of Montana. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, so I'd like to spend the rest of our time together just talking about three different studies that um, we've been doing at uh, Montana State and with some collaborators in Miles City as well, um, and collaborators who are out on the ground managing weeds. The first one I want to talk about is Canada, the Canada thistle meta-analysis that we did. So as you probably know, Canada thistle is, well, the survey showed that it was the most common noxious weed listed. Um, it's a perennial rhizominous forb. It was first found in Montana in the eight, late 1800s. So it has been around for a long, long time. And it has been a problem, not just in Montana, but really the northern Great Plains all the way out to, you know, probably this side of the Cascades, Canada thistle is a problem. There's about 1.4 million acres of this in Montana. So it's been a perennial problem and something that we just still can't control very well. Um, anybody in here dealing with Canada thistle? <laughs> and will admit it, good for you, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, because this is, it's such, it's been around for such a long time, there's been a lot of research done on it over the years. And uh, colleagues and I decided that, hey, let's go back into the literature and see if we can't learn something from everything that's already been done on Canada thistle. You know, before we set up another trial and test different treatments, let's go to the literature and see if we can make sense and learn anything from research that's already been done. So we did a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is essentially research about research. And the way you do this is you define a research question. And in our case, it was, what techniques are most effective at controlling Canada thistle? You look through all the literature, that the peer-reviewed literature that's been published on this question. You, so, you, you select relevant studies based on some predetermined criteria that you have. You pull the data out of those studies. You po pool it all together, and you analyze the data and then you report your results. So what I'm going to do is show you the results of this Canada Thistle meta-analysis and see if we can learn anything from it. So um, we found a little, little over 1,800 articles in the literature on Canada Thistle. The oldest dated back to the 1870s. Now this is like a peer-reviewed uh, published journal article. We had to actually exclude most of the records that we found because they didn't, um, they, they like weren't written in English. They, they were, they could have been studies that were just looking at Canada thistle biology and ecology and didn't necessarily test any treatments to try to control Canada thistle. 
And we ended up having uh, just under 600 articles that we were able to, that were eligible in terms of meeting our predetermined criteria, which is a pretty good number of articles for a meta-analysis. When we broke those um, down, we, had, we ended up with 55 articles that came from cropping systems and 45 articles that came from perennial systems, so pastures and rangeland. And that gave us uh, 650 data points for the cropping articles, 376 for the perennial systems. Now I'm going to show you the results from the perennial articles because I work in range and wildlands, so those are perennial <coughs> plant-dominated systems. Now, don't be frightened when I show you the next slide. Okay, you're going to see a lot of dots, a lot of data, a lot of lines, but we're going to walk through it together, okay? <laughs> so these are the results of the Canada thistle in perennial systems. So on the left uh, axis, you're going to see the different control tactics that researchers tested. So some manipulated water, so like irrigation, um, burning, fertilizer, competition. So that would be like seeding something to compete with Canada thistle. Uh, biocontrol, um, we had herbicides or herbicides integrated with these other tools, but we also had non-herbicide integrated. So that would be, they combined these different tools but didn't use any herbicides, okay? So these are the short-term results. That's looking at Canada thistle abundance less than a year, or a year or less, after treatments were applied. Here's the abundance of Canada thistle long-term, greater than a year, which you see we had far fewer studies to work with. Now you see all these dots. These are the, this is called the um, effect size. So what this is, is if you looked at Canada thistle in an area that was treated, right here, compared to Canada thistle in an area here that was not treated, and you, so you compare the treated to the not treated, that's like the ratio, the abundance, okay? So anything that falls to the left of this dotted line, which is no effect, means Canada thistle was reduced. Anything to the right means you actually increase Canada thistle with that treatment. Now the lines around each dot is the confidence interval. And if a confidence interval crosses the zero line, it means no effect. And if the confidence interval crosses another confidence interval, it means these two results are the same, okay? Same, these two would be similar to each other. So if we look at the short-term results, there were a lot of different treatments that reduced Canada thistle in the short term, okay? And most of them were pretty similar to each other. However, herbicides or herbicides integrated with other tools gave the best control of Canada thistle. Now if we look at long term, again biocontrol, mowing, herbicides or herbicides integrated, all reduced Canada thistle long term, herbicides integrated with other tools work the best. Now the, what I think is important about these findings is that um, we know herbicides, they are the most common tool used for uh, weed control, okay? But what these data show with Canada thistle, especially if you want to get longer term control, is you only get good control when that herbicide is integrated with other tools. Okay. The other thing that the, the meta-analysis reveals is, see all these numbers next to the data points? What do you think those are? Yeah, they're, they're the, number of, um, the number of trials or the number of data points we had to calculate that effect size. Look at how many data points we have with herbicides. Short term, 120, compared to not very many for the other things. Same with the longer term. What the meta-analysis reveals is that there are some control tactics that look promising, but we really haven't researched them very much. For example, um, mowing. You know, mowing did, mowing did pretty well. It worked just as well as herbicides, actually, long term, but only, we only had four data points to work with. So what the meta-analysis can help us do is identify research gaps uh, to move forward on promising tools that haven't been researched very much, okay? Questions on that? All right. 
Okay, the next study, Horealism. Anybody, do you know what Horealism is? Oh, some of you, yeah, yeah, Canada Thistle, Horealism. What else do you have? <laughs> oh, you know what they are, good for you. Uh, well, Horealism, it's, a, it's an invasive mustard. It can be anywhere from an annual to a short-lived perennial. That's all, this is all Horealism in the background. This is uh, near Hebgen Lake. It was first found in Gallatin County in the early 1900s. And I would say that right now Gallatin County is kind of the epicenter of Horealism <coughs> infestations in the state. There's not a lot of Horealism in Montana relative to some of our other species, but it does seem to be increasing. This is what, it, I'll just give you a quick overview of what it looks like. It's hard to identify in the rosette stage, but once it flowers, it has these white uh, four petals like all mustards have. But see how the petals are notched at the tip? So it all, here's a good, good shot right here. So it almost looks like there's eight petals on each flower, but it's actually four petals that are notched at the tip. Um, here's a picture of a plant. And one of the most diagnostic features of Horealism, which you can't see unless you have a hand lens, are these star-shaped hairs. And you can tell that there's hairs on the stem and the leaves, but you can't really tell they're star-shaped unless you put them under a hand lens or a dissecting scope. That's a picture we took with our dissecting scope. And then these oval seed pods. So that's my effort to get you all somewhat familiar with Horealism. Um, but let's talk about the, the, the research that we did. So this plant is challenging to um, manage for a couple reasons. First, it's difficult to identify in that rosette stage. And that's really, if you were to treat it with herbicides, that's the stage that you would get the best control in that rosette stage. The other thing that is extremely tricky about this plant um, is that it has a really prolonged flowering period. I've seen this plant flowering in April in Bozeman, actually on, at, on the campus of MSU, I'm embarrassed to say. I have also seen it flowering in October pretty routinely. So what happens is you have plants that are simultaneously flowering and producing seeds at the same time. Okay, so what I've tried to do is, there's a picture here, it's flowering, but see all the seed pods? Here's a plant that the seed pods have shattered and dropped the seeds, but there's still flowers at the base of that plant. Here's another one, it's flowering and, and producing some seeds. So it's, it only reproduces by seeds. So stopping seed production on this plant is vital for effectively managing it. But managers are having a hard time treating this with herbicides because they're typically not spraying it until they start seeing it flower. And even by the time it's starting to flower, some portions of the plant already have seed pods on them, okay? So uh, several different weed managers approached me over the last five or six years, and they're like, you know, we need some help with Horealism. Um, do you think that if we spray that plant when it's flowering and it, it does have some seed pods forming, are we still getting viable seed production? They wanted to know that the answer to that question. So we worked with um, five different cooperators, four different cooperators, um, uh, at six sites in three general locations. Um, so we had, uh, we worked with the Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy down here around West Yellowstone. We worked with Ruby Resources, which is a, a commercial applicator in the Sheridan area. And then we worked with the Gallatin County Weed District at two sites in Gallatin County. And what we did was they went out and managed their horealism as they would typically manage it. And they sprayed it with a variety of herbicides, whatever they would typically use on horealism between June 20th and early July of 2016. Um, and what we had them do was, we, when they w at the time of spraying, we had them estimate the degree of flowering and seed pod production. And we just said, either tell us if more than 50% of the flowering stem has seed pods or less than 50% of the flowering stem has seed pods. We tried to make it you know, a quick and easy uh, estimate. And then, thankfully, they were all uh, agreeable to leaving a non-sprayed control. 
in the area that they were treating the horulissum so that we had something to control, to compare sprayed to non-sprayed. After spraying, after they did the spraying, we came out about a month later and we collected, uh, we randomly collected plants from the sites. We took those plants back to the campus. Uh, this is Udi Manalid, he's an uh, undergrad that helped us and he counted all the <laughs> seeds from those plants and he tested those seeds for, tested their viability using tetrazoleum tests, okay? Um, so I'm going to show you what we found out for seed productivity and viability. Now, horealism, I'll tell you that there's uh, hardly anything published about it. So almost anything we would do with this plant, we're learning about something new about its biology. So when we looked at, let's just look at seed production. There's been one study that came out of Minnesota in the late 1980s that estimated seed production. In our study, we found that seed production ranged from five seeds per plant up to about 1,800 seeds per plant. It averaged about 430, okay? So, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's in that range. There's nothing published on how viable those seeds are. In our, in our study sites, this is across six study sites, viability ranged from 36 to 73 percent and averaged about 53. So kind of surprising, I mean, some, like spotted knapweed seeds, I mean, if you looked at the viability of spotted knapweed seeds, it's probably in the 90%, I would guess. Um, so really, you know, not super high. And this, these, were, these are data that were from the non-sprayed area. Okay, so no herbicides applied. Um, so the real question was, well, if they spray, all, everybody, everybody sprayed, well, Everybody sprayed when the plant was flowering. Some were sprayed when it was flowering and not too many seed pods being produced. Others sprayed when there were a lot of seed pods present in addition to flowering. But the real question was, did we reduce seed viability by those herbicide applications? So um, we did find that herbicides reduced seed viability even when the plants were sprayed when they were flowering and producing seed pods. So here's our, we, we were able to look at this at five sites. Um, our sixth site just didn't have enough seeds produced to even test viability on those seeds. Um, here's the different herbicides that were used at all of those sites. In every panel, the control where no herbicides were applied is shown on the far left, okay? When you see these red asterisks, that means that the viability was reduced compared to the control with those particular herbicide treatments, okay? Um, so in all cases, herbicides were reducing seed viability to very low numbers. Um, interestingly, um, I shouldn't say in all cases, there was something strange going on at the Brown Ranch, this was near Sheridan, that this chlorosulfuron plus 2,4-D application actually increased viability to like 80%. It also increased total seed production. So at this point in time, I would say do not <laughs> treat um, horulism with chlorosulfuron, which is Telar, which interestingly enough, a lot of people do treat horealism with Tellar. So um, I would like to do more research in a little more controlled setting to see maybe what's going on with that particular herbicide in horealism. But this is really good news for weed managers because it means even though they're not getting out there at the most opportune time, their efforts are still making a difference in really reducing the production of viable seeds on horealism. So I'm excited about that paper. We just, about a month ago, uh, we submitted that to Invasive Plant Science and Management. So it's in review right now. Any questions on horealism? Yes. What's pollinating the plant? What's pollinating the plant? Um, I don't know specifically. It is insect pollinated. It's not just like a windborne. Um, there's a little bit of information in the literature that came from the Midwest looking at pollinators, but it's, mm, the, the methods in that paper are a little bit 
sketchy, like, but yeah, I don't know what's pollinating it out here, specific insects. Any other questions? Yeah, Robert. Why is it called uh, Oreolisum? Was it the Elysium actually in nomenclature earlier? Yeah, uh, it's Bertaroa in Canna. I know, I know. Oh, the oh. Why is it called in, in, uh, yeah. in I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. I just thought it might have been before actually called Elysium. It could have been, yeah. I have not looked at I don't know. any history of its naming. Yeah. And some people, I think, accidentally call this white hop. Possibly, yeah. I have yep. that peer reviewed, and okay. uh, I was asked, hey, look at our white hop. It's going crazy. We have that reviewed. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> it's going crazy, you said? <laughs> I mean, we have, or it's, we have yeah. present here. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it is a tap-rooted, white top is rhizominous, so you can pull this plant. You'd have a hard time pulling white top if you're struggling with how to tell the two apart. So, okay, I'm gonna wrap, I'm gonna go through this last study pretty quick, so I'm not, I'm talking too much. So revegetation, I, I have a strong interest um, in revegetation and in, in trying to figure out how we can get desirable species established in places where weeds are currently growing. So I'm going to show you some results from a study that was uh, looking at some long-term, the long-term outcome of revegetation. And I was, this was such a lucky situation to be in that uh, there were four seeding studies that took place near Corvallis um, on the Calf Creek game wildlife management area, if you're familiar with that area, just near Corvallis and Hamilton. Um, four of the, three of the studies were there. One of the studies was uh, north of Missoula up in the Nine Pipes area. Uh, these were um, seeded in the early 90s, um, and there hadn't been any follow-up management done at these sites. And at these sites, we actually still had the plot maps, and we could go out and find some of the plot markers 9 and 15 years post-seeding. Um, and it was a really great opportunity to go back and see what had happened with these studies where they had applied treatments to spotted knapweed um, at, at three of the areas, and the other site was spotted knapweed and sulfur sinkafoil. So there's a quick schematic of where the sites were. Now, in these four studies, they, they had all been published um, by Roger Sheely, who used to be at Montana State University, and Jim Jacobs was part of the et al. And he just retired from the NRCS in Bozeman and was still around when we did this study, and he helped us. He was out there sampling with us. He had all the plot maps. But these were some of the different control treatments that had been tried to control the noxious weed. Then these were the different seeding treatments that were applied across these different studies. Each study was kind of unique. Um, you know, some they tried tillage. This one, they, they've changed the seeding rates. Um, this one, they had a cover crop. They broadcast versus drilled, etc. Lots of different uh, treatments tried. And then these were the species that were seeded, okay? So we were able to go back. These three studies were 15 years post-seeding when we sampled them, and this study was nine years post-seeding. So well, this is the, the results of the study that was 15 years post-seeding. I'm only showing you the data from, um, from one of those studies, okay? In the top graph, we're looking at spotted, this is seeded grass biomass. So this is two years after it was seeded, six years after it was seeded, and 15 years after it was seeded. The bottom graph is showing spotted knapweed biomass two years, six years, and 15 years post-seeding. Now the reason you see four dots for each year is that this particular data comes from a study that uh, manipulated seeding rate. So 500 seeds per square meter, 1,250, and 12,500 seeds per square meter. The seeded grass biomass, it didn't look very promising initially. This is in a log, a natural log scale. But if you convert those numbers, um, there are about 
29, 30 kilograms per hectare, which is pretty equivalent to pounds per acre the, in the second year. By 15 years post seeding, there was almost 2,000 kilograms per hectare. I'll show you a picture. Now, while the seeded grass is increasing, the spotted knapweed was decreasing. Um, and in this particular data point, um, that was the high seeding rate, 15 years post seeding, knapweed biomass was 86% lower. So here's a picture from this site, and th this is a case where a picture's worth a thousand <laughs> words. Here's blue bunch wheatgrass that was seeded right here in a strip. That's the seed, um, the drill seeder. Right next to it is a non-seeded area that you can see is still dominated by spotted knapweed. Here's another strip here. You can see the strips scattered throughout this research site. Okay. Now at the site that we sampled nine years post-seeding, it was not as promising. Here's the, um, here's the data from um, nine years post-seeding. We only had found about 10 kilograms per hectare of our seeded grass at that particular site. And what's interesting is if you go back to the, the original paper, one year post-seeding, the seedling densities were quite high. In one case, you know, 132 seedlings per square meter, that's pretty darn good for one year post-seeding. So at this site, it looked more promising initially and didn't look as good nine years later, where at the other site, it didn't look very promising two, even six years post-seeding, but 15 years later, it looked great. And, you know, the people wish they would have seeded all over the place <laughs> because it looks so good compared to non-seeded areas. Um, so I'm going to just leave that for food for thought, why the difference. But what's really cool is we had another opportunity we sampled last summer. This was integrated management of leafy spurge. So this was an area where they integrated different herbicides with different se uh, seeded grasses. We had a volunteer sampling day and we went back, back and sampled these plots and I'm, I'm working with those data. Um, now, so hopefully we have another paper coming out in the next year or two that look is another example of the long-term effects of seeding. Okay, um, I would I forgot to say that in that the revegetation project that occurred near Hamilton and Corvallis, the different treatments that were applied to control the weed in the first place, they kind of fell out of the equation 15 years post seeding. It didn't. It didn't really matter what you had done initially. What mattered was that you had put something desired in there, something to compete with the napweed. Okay, so um, I know I talk a lot about invasive plants. This is me standing in a ventanata infestation up on the bison range. And I know that I get kind of like tunnel vision with the seaweed, killweed, must do something about weed. And I think we probably all do that to a certain extent. But the real reason I work on weeds is because I love native plants and I love native uh, plant communities and, and thinking about protecting them and, um, you know, for a long time is really why I do the type of work that I do. And what I, I hope is why if you're out there managing weeds, it's one of the reasons why you manage weeds is to, to have that healthy desired vegetation that um, meets management objectives. So thank you for your time and your attention. There's my contact information if you ever want to talk to me about weeds. And if there's any questions now, I'd be happy to try to answer those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how do you get your volunteers? Or do you have like already a pool of volunteers? Do you want to volunteer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do not have a pool of volunteers. So the picture you saw of all of us out that were out there sampling, I reached out to just colleagues with the Missoula County Weed District. They have kind of their pool of volunteers. I reached out to the for my Forest Service contacts in that area, um, extension contacts, and um, I have a colleague who does research at U of M. He brought his crew out, and it was just kind of word of mouth. So if you're interested, just give me your name before uh, you leave here today or, or email me yeah and then I'll have your contact information and I'll just add it to the list but um, I don't know when I'll have opportunities to do something like that again but um, 
they're really cool opportunities to be able to go back to long-term studies like that. And, I mean, you can always count Horiolis some seeds for us if you want to do that. I'd mail some over to Butte, and you could count them in the comfort of your home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Robert. Also, I just really like this long-term study uh, approach of yours. I think this is great. And it also is just kind of sends a message to us in Butte where we are doing restoration and trying to fight against different things, which address would be our... Mm -hmm. Reclamation grasses that results will not be seen right in the first two three years. That it showed that if I was doing the project after two years, I would have been probably fired because no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no yeah. significant results were mm -hmm. seen. But after fifteen, it was just great. yeah. Seven I actually had that happen, a reveg project. It was spotted knapweed and cheat grass over around Missoula. I seeded it. I was down on my hands and knees looking for seedlings one and two years post-seeding, found nothing. I pretty much walked away from the project, and uh, four years later, I just happened to be driving by my plot. You know, oh, I'm going to pull in and see what those plots look like. And lo and behold, the grasses that we had seeded were there, and they were like this tall. There was Basin Wild Rye this tall, and I'm like, oh my God, we're coming back here and we're sampling this. <laughs> so we did come back and sample that and we published it. But one of the, th yeah, with revegetation, it's patience is a virtue, and it just takes, takes so long to really tell what's, bonding, if it's. Sometimes it's just, you have four years, you need to prove something. And yeah. Basically, if you just look at all the literature, it's not really possible to show all these results in four years where you do the bonding cuts. And yeah, and you think about the number of years it took for a site to become degraded. Yeah. You know, when you think about restoring it, it, it is, it's a long-term process. And, and a lot of times we don't have the funding or the patients, like the funding structures aren't, aren't, aren't such that we can wait as long as we really need to. You had a question or comment? I was just surprised that cheatgrass isn't on an octus weed list. Yeah. Is there any efforts to put it on? Is there some conspiracy? So cheatgrass and the <laughs> spotted or cheatgrass in the noxious weed list. So it was petitioned to be listed, I think, in 2010. And um, I am one of the people that sits on this working group that reviews petitions of species to get listed. And there was a lot. There was great debate about cheatgrass. One of the main reasons it was hard to get listed was um, the seed industry has a very difficult time separating cheatgrass seed out of other grass seed. And if it gets listed as a noxious species, then they're restricted, that it ha they have to list it as a restricted species on a bag of seed. And if you look at the seed industry in Washington, Oregon, you know, our competing states, if it's not listed there, then it, it could come in on seed, but the seed industry in Montana would be hurt because it would be a restricted species for their seeds. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, another issue with cheatgrass is it's so ubiquitous that um, how would you ever like enforce it being a noxious weed and you know people don't really know how to manage it very well because you're trying to control a not a undesirable grass typically in grassland settings so there would be the potential for a lot of non-target injury to desirable species um, yeah there was a lot of debate about cheatgrass so right now it's a um, it's a regulated plant in Montana so you can't intentionally spread it or sell it um, and it, by listing it as a regulated species, it opened up ave avenues for research funding from the Noxious Weed Trust Fund. So research and education funding. But I actually spend most of my time doing research on cheatgrass, which I didn't talk about any of that today. But So do you have any good results in planting around cheatgrass? Or um, not really. <coughs> Um, it's tough. Uh, it, I think it, it takes, you know, multiple years of control and then probably seeding post multiple years of control. 
The, ch the seed only lives a couple years. So if you can get good control of cheatgrass for a couple years and stop the seeds from going into the seed bank, you can deplete that seed bank. And, and then I think that's the time to come in and try to seed something desirable. So what's the control? Mowing early? Uh, mowing when it would be flowering or uh, herbicide applications in the fall. The best time to spray cheatgrass is in the fall, not in the spring, not when you start to see it turn that reddish purple color. Um, we've, we have some grazing, it, sheep grazing integrated with herbicide uh, research that we just finished up that we'll be analyzing the data. But I think, you know, it's a, it's a you got to hit it from a lot of different directions. Biological controls? There are, there are some uh, soil-borne pathogens that are being developed as bioherbicides. Um, so far, the data that I, I have seen uh, is minimal, and the data I have seen are not very promising. Yes? Can you tell us about all those pieces of literature yeah, on I, I just brought, desk? Yeah, I brought a few of our extension publications. We have a publication on almost every species that's on the noxious weed list. I just brought a handful of ones that I had handy in my lab before I came up. So please, I would prefer not to take any home with me. So, um, and then you can always go, all of these are available as PDFs online too. So if you like to read stuff online, you can do that. Was there a question or comment over here? Okay. Mowing is tough for cheatgrass because it likes to go down, but but white vinegar can do that. Why what? White vinegar. You've done tried that, and what happens? It dies. Really? At what stage? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what stage were you applying that? Like growth stage? Yeah. So vinegar is a. It's like a contact natural herbicide. So it won't just, you probably know this, but I'm just for the rest of you in the audience, it, it doesn't like translocate through a plant. So it's, it's good on annuals when the annuals are small and in the seedling stage. Uh, it's not as good on perennial species that can grow back from the roots. But yeah, it's acting like a contact herbicide. Right what was it? Napweed. Napweed. Yeah. You like vinegar, though. <laughs> Your yard smells like vinegar. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Because you can always eat it for salad. Yeah, and you know, mowing is mowing. I think is a good tool, especially in um, in town and urban settings where you can't use a lot of herbicides, or you're not going to bring in grazing animals. Although they do that in some like develop you know housing developments and whatnot but the trick with mowing is uh, we want to mow a weed when it first starts showing up and what happens if you mow napweed when it first starts showing up yeah it ends up growing very prostrate about this tall just under the height of your mowing deck and it still flowers so there as research, research suggests that the best time to mow is when it's starting to flower. Or if it's cheatgrass, you know, the cheatgrass might be this tall and it's starting to get the, the flowers or the seed heads on it before the seeds are hard. Because if you come along and mow a plant off at that stage, it has invested a lot of resources to get to that growth stage. And if you come along and take the plant off then, a lot of times it doesn't have the resources left before the growing season is over to grow back and flower and produce seed. So, so if you're mowing. Figure out how to make seeds even when they're cut off. Yeah, they're, they're not really. They, it has to be pretty far along in the, and like with napweed, it would have had to be pollinated and, you know, so they haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> Just yeah. one short one. What, what was your aim with the Ventanata study? What was, what's your main question with Ventanata? Was that picture I showed, you mean? Yeah. Just yeah. Um, well, I do have a, just a herbicide trial out on Ventanata because right now we don't even know what to use for herbicides on it because it's so new. But that's, that picture was taken. We're doing a study looking at the, those four invasive annual grasses, 
And we're just looking at their impacts on forage production, forage quality. Um, we're looking at litter decomposition and how it differs between, among those four grasses. Just trying to really get a sense of the, the impacts that these different four different invasive annual grasses are potentially having. So, um, you know, if you think about how that would be applied to management, we can't manage an annual grasses everywhere because there's too many of them <laughs> in too many places. So it would help us figure out, okay, which annual grass is the worst if we have to prioritize areas for management. So, yeah. But we have, we sampled annual grass infested rangeland at 13 sites across the state this past summer, all the way from Miles City to Malta to Missoula. And um, looking at the different annual grasses. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, everybody.